the recording button. What is the primary or the main, the main topic that we, 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 we plan to be able to be there are concerned? Can anybody answer that question? Obviously, um, uh, we don't have it, so. What, yes, is it Udia, Lai? Yes, sir. What is it that we're looking at today? The Alcosa line? All right, so ladies and gentlemen, recording is in progress and this lecture has started. And this afternoon, I want to take you through ceramic technology and traditions of West Africa. So what I must draw your attention to is that the idea of the Iron Age doesn't necessarily mean that every society was practicing Iron technology at a particular point in time. Uh, some were had access to the technology, others did not. Um, others could uh, were still relying on some stone tools. But what was ubiquitous or numerous during the period of this, the Iron Age was ceramic. A lot of ceramic uh, traditions and technologies emerged all over uh, the sub region. And that did back several thousands of years. And today we want to look at uh, the, the, the emergence of ceramic traditions in West Africa and uh, to see what role these uh, technological traditions played in the, in the emergence of social complexity in the West African sub-region between 500 BC and uh, AD 19. So that is the topic we're dealing with today. Okay. Um, so to start with, uh, I have a question there. What can the archaeologists learn from studying ancient ceramic technology and traditions of West Africa? This is a typical question that I ask students in the exams. The question is, what can the archaeologists learn from studying ancient ceramic technology and traditions of of Africa. So you are aware that we have various levels of material uh, traditions or data that we use as archaeologists trying to reconstruct and interpret our past uh, societies. And what we're saying is that ceramics uh, play a uh, role in that. And is there anything we can study and, and understand by using the material or particularly Asian uh, ceramic technology and traditions? That is a question that I am asking. Is there anybody who has an idea what is knowable uh, when one studies uh, technological traditions uh, of ceramics? Can anybody tell us what we can learn as archaeologists Yes. Yeah. 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 how the study of ceramics and ceramic technology or traditions enable us to uh, understand uh, ancient societies. How? Huh? 
Hello, sir. Yes, I'm listening. So it can help archaeologists to identify a particular type of poetry they use to help them to understand how the people live, their communication networks. Okay. And how, the food they eat. Can you expand it and I can you give us some examples? How how can that be done? Um so, so in case you find um uh, let me say a piece of poetry in archaeological record. Yeah. So, so it can be analyzed to know the type of food they use, the medicine, the type of medicine they use in their past. Okay. okay, that's right. You're right on that. What else comes to mind? Hello, sir. Yes, I'm listening. Yeah, can you also say that um, um, when archaeologists find, find um, ceramics during excavation, like it provides them um, some kind of vital information, like what Portia was saying about poetry, maybe their lifestyle. And with, with ceramics, it, um, it helps you, like it makes um, tracing the past a bit easier. Okay, how? how can you give any specific example? Um, so, yes. Uh, so for example, like pottery, let's say we are excavating a place and we find pottery there, like a broken pottery there. Oh, yes. You yes. can easily tell that. Yes, please go ahead. You are on point. Go ahead. So you can easily tell yeah. that the, the people that settled at that particular place either used it for medicine or food based on the um, particles you find when trying to date it or when you put it under a microscope, something. <laughs> Okay, you are very right on that. You are right on that. That's accurate. Okay. Okay, so what else? What else? And besides um, reconstructing past cultural traditions, uh, life ways like food, food habits, the types of food people were eating and had access to, the means of processing food. What other means can we learn? Somebody here, Nana Kwame says, I think it will help the archaeologists to know the kind of tools and materials the Asian people use in making the ceramics. So yeah, he's talking about the technological aspect um, of pottery. Also, Hello, sir. Um, oh. just a second. Also, the skills they possess. I think uh, their artistry. I think his uh, Nana Kwame is spot on. Uh, when it, when you look at what he has posted in the chat. So indeed, he's looking at the technological aspect of the work because when you find a piece of ceramic, you may be able to tell whether they were, the ceramics were produced by just a hand method like coil, just coiling the clay and using some uh, simple wooden tools to shape it or whether they use the, the wheel method where uh, they can use a uh, wheel powered uh, uh, things of uh, producing ceramics. So, yes, yeah. uh, that is, is true. On a, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah, please. Can you say that when you find um, ceramics at um, an excavated site, it tells the people's um, beliefs or so? Because you see, some of the poetry you find at the um, Make make uh, the case first. Make the case first. It's okay. Uh, so I'm saying that um, poetry or ceramics on at um, an excavated site tells um, the value of the people. Okay. So um, what you're saying is we can derive um, some information, and specifically you're mentioning what. The value, religious practices and the web views? Yes, yes. Okay, great. I think uh, you are right on that. So that's where the elements of uh, the traditions and uh, the symbolic values and so on and so forth uh, come in. 
And uh, to illustrate that, when we go back to um, what we have on the screen from the beginning, you can see that these are not utilitarian way, right? This is not for storing your banku or putting fufu in there and eat, right? Same for this one. You can see that they they are they are expressing symbolism. They are relating issues about death, woody uh, actually, or what do you call it, the death ladder. There are no one person who can. Everybody will die. Uh, so here, then people are beginning to talk about cosmology, other form of representations that are non-utilitarian. So uh, you are perfect on that uh, point also. Uh, somebody has written, if we are some, says, certain inscriptions on ceramics identify the existence of trade relations with other people. Yes, by analyzing uh, ceramics or pottery, one is able to identify trade patterns and trade routes because it enables us to know where things are coming from. Excellent expositions from each one of you this morning, this afternoon rather, and uh, I appreciate that much. Uh, we're going to try to make a move to look at uh, what we have there. So uh, what the kind of archaeologists learn, these are great points you have made. Let's see what uh, Richard says, uh, Akosa says, because pots and styles were shared among groups, archaeologists can often relate sites in time and space um, because they contain the same ceramic types. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It uh, helps to know the type of clay used, whether stoneware, earthenware. Yeah, yeah. So yes, of course. You guys are um, we are talking very great stuff. Excellent point. Now let's look at some definitions here. I agree with everyone. The points you have raised this afternoon are excellent. And then somebody says, I also think it is in which people they integrate, interacted with, yes. So trade connections, marriage networks, uh, social networks, and so on and so forth. Excellent point. So what, what is it when we talk of ceramics? Uh, what are we referring to? Yeah, somebody talk about linguistic diversity, backgrounds, you right? So let's look at uh, what we talk about when we, uh, we make reference to what ceramics are. So we say ceramics are artificial stone. We say artificial because they, they are hard as stone, but they are made, they are not natural. Made by firing a mixture of clay and water includes bricks, tiles, porcelain, terracotta, clay figurines, and others. So you can see that the ceramics, when we talk of ceramics, is broader. It includes um, things as well. Bricks, tiles, porcelain, terracotta, clay figurines, and so on and so forth. Then pottery, on the other hand, includes only ceramics made into tableware, utensils, and cooking and storage vessels. So you see that pottery is a little bit limited. Uh, it encompasses or includes only ceramics made into tableware, like what you eat from, utensils you cook, you cook in, um, things you store water, you store food in, yes. Whereas a ceramic can include um, tiles, roofing tiles, uh, drainage uh, pipes, uh, terracotta figurines, and so on and so forth. Is that is that point clear? Is that distinction clear? Does that make sense to you? All right, so we're going to box on. Let me see the comment here. It says, sir, you haven't read my own. Okay, so you should have copied it and pasted it. Let me see what Udia says. Udia Eli says, what about their political practice? For instance, you can tell what type of ceramic is used by the elite and what uh, it was used by the poor, the middle standards and so on. Yeah, 
So it, it's, it's a means by which we differentiate social status. So you dear, you are perfect on that point. We can use that uh, as a means of this differentiate or distinguishing social status. And uh, that's a very solid point. Um, and then uh, you are right on that. Yeah. Okay, so we continue with our definitions. Then in some cases is the, you hear potsheds. I don't want to hear broken pottery or pottery pieces. There are terminologies for that. So when we say shed, in terms of a, um, the shed with an E and a shard with an A, in the American context, we are talking of pieces of broken ceramic. So it can be ceramic tiles, roofing tiles, broken pipes, uh, table where when they all break, they become part of a uh, shed. So in Ghana, we say pot sheds, pot sheds, pot sheds. Then we have shards with the A. In the American context, they are referring to broken glasses. But in the European context, if you are reading European uh, text or archaeological publication, sheds or shards with the A refer to. Um, European uh, archaeology refers to what broken ceramics. So you need to pay attention to that. Okay. I think it's clear enough. This is recorded and I will share it with that. Then, um, so this in the case of uh, American archaeology, these are pot sheds. So we use that in Ghana a lot P O T S H E R D E S, pot sheds. And then uh, we see that changes when uh, you look at the other context. Okay, so these are some examples of archaeological ceramics. Typically, they come to us in the uh, broken pieces. We will not have the full range of things. Uh, pieces will come from the shoulders, uh, from the base, from the bottom. We have terracottas that they define as uh, coarse materials, low fire ceramics. The Chinese terracotta army, the Kuma terracotta figurines are typical examples that come to mind when we are dealing with uh, terracotta figurines or so on and so forth. Okay, so these are some examples. Then, if we move from the uh, terracotta figurines, we come to earthenware. Earthenware ceramics or pottery include. A ceramics with a medium porosity fired at a wide range of temperatures, and they may be glazed, that is having a shiny surface uh, on them, or they may not be glazed, that you have this dull one. So uh, when we talk about uh, earthenware, these are some of the things we are talking about. We have porcelain. Porcelains are fine, high fired ceramics with a white body. So and the temperatures are higher. That's why it's a high fired ceramics. And when you compare these to the terracotta figurines, they are not fired to the high degree of temperatures. And so you have these brown colors, sometimes with dark inner, inner layers. But when it comes to porcelains, they are pure white, one uniform consistent uh, uh, fabric. Okay, then uh, if you're dealing with ceramics, you also want to understand the forms of ceramics, the shapes they take, the size, and so on and so forth. What do you think we can learn by understanding the form, the shapes, and sizes of ceramics? What are some of the possible ideas that one can learn? Uh, yes. What can one learn by studying the forms of, uh, of ceramics? The form they take. Are they hemispherical? Are they open bowls? Are they closed jars? Somebody is making a something noise. Can you see that? Yeah. Who is farming in the in the in the in the in the Karim, mute yourself. Hey, yes, yes. Oh, 
Okay, you have caused a lot of mess here. Yeah, pay attention. Okay, so I'm stopping. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and relaunch it. So I was uh, making reference to the forms that um, we have uh, forms of archaeological or, or vessels, uh, archaeological uh, ceramics or forms. What I'm asking is, what can one learn by studying the shapes and the forms of archaeological uh, materials or ceramics in general? What can we learn from that? What can we learn? Hello, sir. Yes, I'm listening. Please go ahead. What the form shows the style in which they are made. It shows what? The style. Of the style. Okay, so the form is part of the of, style. Uh, yes. Production. I agree. Uh, so what What would a style enable? Uh, constituting uh, the material or the, this. It shows where the material is coming from. So that's yes. one. Yes, you are right. So certain shapes yes. and form can uh, allude or the, enable us to understand where the uh, of production. Okay, that's right. What else can we learn from uh, from the forms in terms of the whether they are jars, they are open jars, they are closed? Uh, what can what else can we learn besides the source of production in the area is coming from? Hello, sir. Yes, please go ahead. Sir, please can you say the form tells what they are used for? Yes, you are right. That. And that we refer to it as what? The function. Huh? So the function, okay, the function of the vessels, right? So the, the shape of a vessel is uh, almost directly linked to its usage or function. So what a vessel served in the past can easily be attributed or derived from uh, the shape in which it is made or the form can anybody give us some classic examples as to what we can derive? What kind of shape would tell us what, for instance? Is there please the question again? Can you mention a form, a vessel form, and tell us what that vessel could likely uh, be used for? For example, if you have a vessel with a big open orifice, open uh, mouth, can you tell us what it, it's likely to, to be used or to have been used for? There may be a reservoir for water or... Which, which kind of, of the vessel form will facilitate? Is it a widely open jar or... A smaller jar with op small opening. Which one? The widely open jar. And why is that important? The, um, so maybe maybe they use that one for water as a like it serves as a reservoir. For water storage. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, that's fine. So a jar in itself. It means uh, is a, a long standing uh, vessel that uh, has a relatively, uh, what I'll say, a longer height than the, the opening. So like we have over here, this is a jar, this is a bowl, okay? So a bowl has a wider diameter or opening compared to the height and vice versa in the case of a jar. So certainly jars are preferred mean by which uh, we store stuff. So this is the question I asked you. So based on the form, uh, one can learn, you know, the form can tell us about the function, vessel function. What was the vessel used for? Was it for cooking? Because you can use this deep one maybe for cooking soup. Maybe you can use to cook a beans, which you don't need to be stirring. But if you are cooking soup that you need to go in there once a while to, to stay, then you need an open jar, for example. 
and so on and so forth. So yes, that these are some of the elements we can learn. Uh, so the form can tell us whether it was used for cooking, for storage, uh, for for food serving individuals or group serving because an individual's bowl will be small, food bowl. There are people who eat communally and they will have very huge uh, openings of their jam. So these are a very important point that I want you to come along with. We can also use the forms to de determine uh, the relative age of the tradition that produces it or when the, the materials, the, the pottery were produced or the ceramics were produced. Because every season uh, or period of production uh, may be related to a particular group of people at a particular point in time. And so we are able to use the, the, the forms to determine that. We also can use the form to determine the capacity. How much can the pot contain? How many gallons of water? We can also use that to determine uh, whether you can uh, place certain content in it or not. Okay, and then uh, any other things that you, you can you can find. Okay, so what also can we learn from manufacturing methods and techniques? Uh, what can we learn? Here we're saying, if one of your colleagues provided that information earlier, if we find out that the verses we are dealing with were made by the coiling method or by the wheel method, they are sleeping, they are smudging or smoke glazing, they are the temper, they are the firing, what kind of temperatures the fire are. Is it a porcelain, high degree firing, or is it a low, medium temperature? The finishing, what are the surface finishing? Are there decorations on it? If so, is this just a utilitarian way for cooking, for storing water, or is for a religious ceremonial practices and functions and so on and so forth? So these are some of the things we can learn. Uh, the vessel capacity. Can you cook soup in that? Or when you put your soup in it, it's going to break because it's too thick or it's thin enough to facilitate uh, uh, cooking and so on and so forth. So uh, the, definitely as archaeologists studying uh, ceramics, we have the ability to learn so much uh, about ancient traditions and societies by looking at the technological traditions and the technology that uh, uh, apply to ceramic making. And in the case of West Africa, uh, we, 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 we learn a lot uh, from that. Now, what are some of the specific means by which we study ceramics, depending on what we want to learn from? Um, so we've already answered the first question, why we study ceramics, uh, archeological ceramics, to gain knowledge about chronology, that's a date, about uh, movement of people, relationship between different groups, um, function, uh, technological level, and so on and so forth. Then uh, we have, it's also about identity issues. We have what are some of the major techniques for studying archaeological ceramics. To study archaeological ceramics and make the maximum use of that knowledge, one has to have certain specific uh, methods or uh, uh, techniques for studying that. We have a neutron activation analysis, NAA, which can help us to zero in on which specific sites uh, ceramics are being produced. We can also have a um, mineralogical analysis, which is simpler and less complex compared to NAA. This can, uh, by using just uh, the minerals, like a first part, the presence of mica or garnet, we can tell that, oh, these ceramics are coming from Shai area, the Krobo area, or the Achim area, or Winnibar area, and so on and so forth. Oh, somebody says the screen is not showing. Let me relaunch, that's weird. I'm sorry, thank you, thank you for raising that point. Uh, I'm sharing it again. Let me see. It will tell me you are seeing it, then I, I can help. I can continue. I still haven't seen any sign that you can see. Can you see the screen? 
Question. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I was saying that uh, to understand and be able to come up with vessel forms, vessel capacity, the, the, the function of vessel, uh, to know what they were cooking inside, to know where the vessels are being distributed and produced and, and traded, to reconstruct trading connections, migration patterns, and social stratification, you will need to conduct specific tests. Okay, you have to do formal analysis using your eyes, uh, using the shape. But there are more complex studies that we also conduct uh, using uh, neutron activation analysis, chemical analysis, and all these will give us some more detailed uh, places uh, of their manufacture. Uh, into specific areas, a group of people who manufacture them, and so on and so forth. Okay. Yes. Okay. I will share the, the recordings after. Thank you. So these are some of the stylistic studies or analysis based on the style. We can see which group are producing it, where are these materials being produced and distributed, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, functional analysis will enable us to understand the function. If we study the function, we know these were used for storing water, for storing food, for cooking food, for serving food, for processing uh, uh, gold, or doing something. Yes, your hand is up. If you are some. Say, so please, the screen, even though you are sharing it, but no slide is showing from my side. I don't know about others, too. I think some have claimed we can see it. So it's now that the system is telling me participants can see your sharing. So maybe you are right. By now, you should also be able to see it. Okay, so. Mine is showing, somebody says. Um, so at this point, I've tried it twice. And so. I think, um, I'm sorry, maybe you have a relaunch, you join the, the Zoom again, or you, you do something. Network issue or something. So I'm going to reiterate some of the points you already discussed or you mentioned when I asked the question, what uses we can tell of ceramics um, to the archeology. span So these are some of them. So it says it's good for formulating chronologies. So based on the changing style of the ceramics in the stratigraphic record, one can tell which ones are older and which cultures were producing which one and at what time. So we can use it for relative uh, dating. We'll be able to formulate chronologies. We can say oh, Kintambo cultural style and so on and so forth. So based on style, form and decoration, Archaeologists can uh, group ceramics into different age categories. So, so. Is that understood? And uh, as you rightly mentioned, by studying the technology for producing the ceramics, we can also learn about uh, uh, other components. And so based on the properties of the body, for example, we can tell the flooring technique, the coil wheel, and so on and so forth. So a porcelain cannot be produced by firing it in the open air. You will never attain very high temperatures that can turn the whole posture white. You know, you need to fire it a very high degree beyond 1100 uh, centigrade. So there are also some vessels that you can use coiling method for because you need to have the wheel to be able to produce them. Okay. We are saying by studying patterns of trade based on the distribution of ceramics in different regions. So we can say who, which people are producing the work and how is it getting itself into other areas? Is it through trade? Is it through marriage, marriage that people are carrying on their knowledge? In tradition to other places, or there is a common market where these things were distributed, and so on and so forth. And so, so these are some of the things that we study using 
neutron activation analysis, chemical analysis, stylistic analysis, formal analysis, and ethnographic uh, studies, for example, which can uh, give us some ideas about continuity in the ceramic design style of a particular people. So we can have a ceramic design that we can say, oh, this is coming from the Shah area, this is coming from the Azim area, and so on and so forth. So ladies and gentlemen, these are some of the ways we approach uh, ceramic analysis. Then uh, studying cooking and eating practices. So as we said, we may learn which people are doing the cooking and who, which people are doing the eating and at where the ceramics are located. We can tell about social hierarchy, complexity, inequality, and so on and so forth. We can talk about human adaptation. So in a harsher environment, where you are no longer getting access to food that you can boil. You may go into roasting, and you may be doing a, a cooking of starchy food that we can see the starch when we, we do a lipid analysis. Or uh, we can see that you are grinding more peppers or more tomatoes based on the residue analysis. Uh, studying social, political, and economic boundaries. Depending on the distribution and spread of ceramic types, we can also be able to tell the level of interaction, exchange, and, and identities and political boundaries. So for instance, as in the case of uh, Jenny Juno, uh, Asian Jenny, we did mention that uh, throughout the 800 year period, you can see based on the distribution of ceramics, we're able to say this is the older portion of the settlement. And then the settlement began to spread by AD 300. And by AD 800, we see different ceramic types spreading all over the place. So using ceramic analysis, we are able to understand and uh, delineate the size of a settlement. You can see this is a village settlement. And then this is, uh, we can say it's becoming a, a bigger settlement, a polity. And then later on, we have a huge town or urban community emerging by 800. And we are not doing that by studying buildings, but rather by studying the spread of a ceramic uh, remains across a landscape. And uh, the size of that is enabling us to tell how huge a settlement was in the past or a polity was. Some of you talk about the understanding cosmologies, religious practices, symbolism. Yes, ceramics can uh, uh, analysis can also enable us to do that. In the case of the Koma, Terracotta traditions we've studied, we know that even people were sacrificing animals and pouring blood of monkeys and other animals as sacrifice or offerings to some of these. Uh, Terracutas that we are dealing with. And you can see how we can showcase uh, the distribution of, uh, of the Terracutas and which groups were producing it. Because as you understand the limit of the distribution, you also understand perhaps the limit of the, the political or social influence or the sphere of that particular group of people. Here, in the case of uh, uh, Congo, Central Africa, uh, we see uh, styles that are depicted on human bodies that are also found in fabrics, are also found in ceramics. And so one can understand this interconnection and uh, groups and identity uh, through the study of ceramics. Okay. And then, of course, I mentioned this in the case of Asian Nubia where we have different cultural groups called the Bika group, group A, group C, and so on and so forth. Again, uh, doing this analysis, uh, mineralogical analysis, you can identify minerals, garnet, quartz, uh, Fespa, you can look at the mica, home blend, and all these because the clays that they pick for making this fabric as uh, the ceramics will always carry uh, the trace elements, the minerals, and so on and so forth. 
Okay. So mineralogical analysis can tell us where the ceramics is coming from, uh, who are producing the possibly and so on and so forth. So then the stylistic analysis, which uh, looks at the finishing, the surface finishing and the decoration, you can say, oh, this belongs to that group uh, that lived some 500 years ago, 2000 years ago, and was produced in this region and was traded in that region, so on and so forth. In my own case here, as we say, when I look at some of these pieces, I can tell you the top rule are uh, going back to 800 years ago. Uh, these are 12th century phenomena, ceramics that were produced. And then similar traditions emerge again by about uh, uh, 1400s and then and so on and so forth. So using ceramic analysis, one is able to understand different time perspectives and the delineate chronologies and also discuss the uses uh, of things. So you can see that clearly there's a difference between this set of ceramics that I have here, which are all bowls, and then the set of ceramics here where you have some jars. And then uh, and these are 17th century phenomena. When you look at them, the style became different, a uh, different style, the fabric is different, it looks older here. You come here, it looks newer. There's a smudging, the black suiting, uh, different uh, designs and then so on and so forth. So uh, these are some of the ways we study ceramics that are associated with ritual grounds, ceremonial grounds, like uh, shrines, depot shrine, uh, fairy shrines, about up here. Uh, then the chalices for ritual feasting and so on and so forth. So you can see that clearly ceramics are uh, means by which archaeologists can unravel and uh, understand the issues of uh, resource management, uh, storage facilities for storing grains and water uh, on the Pobo Hill, uh, going back to the 18th, 19th century and so on and so forth. So uh, most of these are found in larger numbers in around ceremonial grounds like shrine areas or their backgrounds, whereas at homes, you can find only one each. Around the palace, we found about 16 of them stuck in the ground. So clearly, it means some people have more access to water or grains than others because of their position. So here then, we are seeing clearly a distinction in the society that we can call hierarchical. Okay. Then through ethnographic studies also, we are able to try to understand the uses of some of these by comparing and gaining information from contemporary societies, uh, interviewing porters, users, and try to see how we can understand uh, practices that uh, are, are not understood readily by archaeologists. So to sum up, we're saying that archaeology, uh, archaeological ceramics are useful in formulating chronologies and uh, that is based on style, form, decorations, or surface finishing. Ceramics can also enable us to understand and study technology based on the properties of the clay. For example, high firing, firing that could only take place in a kiln and not in the open air. Uh, things that can only be done with coil method or wheel technique and so on and so forth. Then we have studying patterns of trade based on the distribution of ceramics in different regions, uh, based on where we are finding, where the production was done and where the consumption was made and uses of ceramics, we can tell of patterns of uh, trade relations, social relations, political boundaries, and so on and so forth. Uh, cooking and eating practices, we can understand environmental changes and uh, preferences and so on and so forth. So um, these are some of the elements uh, that I think uh, are important when it comes to ceramics analysis that I would like you to uh, familiarize yourself with. At this moment, I'll stop sharing the screen and I'll ask if um, you have any questions uh, that you would like to me to address at this point. Sir, please, I can't hear you. Um, I don't know, I don't change. Uh, I'll try and see if you, if you can hear me better now.
Uh, there is a paper that I always share in the class to read by Scott again, symbolic reservoirs and intergroup relations. So Matt Scott uh, used a ceramic analysis to try to understand where designs come from, how designs are shared, and exchange, and so on and so forth. Okay, so there is it. Uh, the same question that I asked you earlier. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen here. And as it, um, that if you have some questions at this moment, I will urge you to ask. That's good. It's always good to uh, ask questions. It enables us to understand where the class is going. Is there anything you would like to ask at this point? Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, please, uh, will you share your slides? Yes. Okay, thanks. On the slide, the recorded uh, lecture. Okay, is there any other question you would like me to address? Okay, so our next topic will be metallurgical traditions and technology in West Africa. So we'll look at iron smelting, we'll look at the copper smelting, uh, whether the ideas are borrowed in, or independently innovated. Um, so we will be looking at this uh, next week. And uh, as next week going, Dr. To be, soon to be, uh, will be joining, taking over for me. Uh, I mean, you know him already, your own man. Uh, Mr. Daniel Kuma uh, will be taking over for me uh, after the next lecture. So if you're ready, uh, I've already shared some of his uh, recorded uh, lectures with you. And so don't wait, start uh, learning about urbanism, urbanization, samples from Timbuktu, Jenny General, Bego, and so on and so forth. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I will bring the class to a close here. And I wish you all the best. Keep reading. And uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, and also, another... hello, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, so the assignments, what, how, how will you be submitted? Um, you give them to your class rep when you have the chance, beginning Friday after the lectures resume. Because tomorrow is holiday. So give everything to your class rep, OK? Okay. 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 Thank you, sir. Yeah. Is there any other question? Sir, yes, sir, please. The song. We didn't play the song. Oh, okay. So we are sir. sir, hello, sir. Yes, sir, what? please. Have you sent the Have you sent the reading materials on agriculture on Sakai? It's always there. It's been there in the material section. I think chapter ten of the reading list that I've shared with you from the very beginning. So chapter ten. Okay. I'm sure, you have to check it. So I, I have talked about this. That uh, you have the, the entire reading material, and I encourage you to look at it. You go to it. Okay. So you already have. Yes, thank you. The ceramics. I want to add that little piece uh, to it um, by Scott, just to that those of you who want to grant yourself a little bit more. You can 